So metabolic syndrome can also be identified by what I think should be a new vital sign, which is measurement of the waist circumference. And you do that at the iliac crest. So when a person is being screened, all they need to do is get a waist measurement uh, at the iliac crest. And if it's over 35 inches in a female or 40 inches in a male, that's pretty much at the belly button, at the umbilicus. 35 inches female, 40 inches male, they're highly likely to have the metabolic syndrome. Let's turn to treatment. When you talk about treatment, you mentioned TLC, therapeutic lifestyle changes. Could you expand on that? In this new guideline, we made a very significant point that it's not just about nutrition or it's not just about exercise, but it's really overall lifestyle change because of very significant evidence that each of these individually contribute. And if you do it all together, there's a far greater likelihood that a person could normalize their lipid levels by doing lifestyle. So the majority of people in the United States could normalize their lipid levels by lifestyle change alone. So a combination of healthy eating could lower LDL cholesterol, for example, by five to 15% in the average person and sometimes higher. Exercise lowers triglycerides and raises HDL. It's important to mention that exercise does not lower LDL. So that's really important to know that. Weight loss does, but exercise does not lower LDL. And then fiber lowers LDL. Physical activity is important for many reasons. And then reaching normal weight can really make a significant change in lipid values. And so that whole combination is called therapeutic lifestyle change in our new guidelines. Generally, we recommend giving a person at least a three to six month trial to see if they reach their goals. The exception would be a person with vascular disease, diabetes, or genetic cholesterol disorders. Those people should be treated right away. And if medications are needed, how do you determine what medication to start? Medication should be chosen on the pattern of lipid disorder the person has. LDL medications are statins, azetamibe or zetia, and the bile acid resins. We also often use what are called sterols, which are the over-the-counter supplements that are found in take control margarine or Benicol. They lower LDL cholesterol. But the most important medicines in that category are statins. If a person has a high triglyceride or low HDL pattern, then the medications we use are niacin, fibrates, and fish oil. So they're really very separate categories depending on if it's LDL or triglyceride and HDL. How often do you get lab monitoring after starting a cholesterol-lowering medication, and what labs do you get? It's really very important to monitor medications at one month after starting a medication for cholesterol because evidence suggests that you'll reach full effect in one month. And also evidence shows that patients will start to deteriorate in terms of their adherence to medication. So you can reinforce to the patient the effectiveness of the medication at a month. You could adjust your therapy if needed, and you could demonstrate safety. The cholesterol medications are very safe. For example, statins are safer than aspirin, but it's important to check an ALT for liver function to make sure that's normal. And in the case of niacin, to check a glucose, fasting glucose, and a uric acid as well as an ALT. And fibrates, we just recommend an ALT just like we do with statins. In summary, what are the key points of the NCEP ATP3 guidelines? The key points are to really focus on the high-risk patients, the patients with atherosclerosis, diabetes, and multiple risk factors. To note that those LDL goals are really based on risk and to do risk calculation in patients with multiple risk factors, to focus on new triglyceride and HDL goals, and to really make your treatment based on the type of cholesterol disorder that the patient has. And what internet resources uh, could we look at uh, to be updated on the latest guidelines? There are three really good resources that I strongly recommend people use. For any heart question or any guideline, I recommend AmericanHeart.org. That's all one word, AmericanHeart.org. And then for our uh, Wisconsin guidelines, I recommend you go to unityhealth.org, a very good resource with multiple guidelines. For good handouts, I mentioned heartdecision.org. We have our risk calculator there and all the handouts we use for patient education. And you can also get all the national guidelines at nih.gov. Thank you very much. You're welcome.